Hello everyone, as promised, I'm going to put together a little bit of a short video lecture here to catch us up to speed on what we haven't been able to do in class together. Um, <clears throat> and the main thing I wanted to talk about was uh, this position in epistemology called reliabilism. So I'm actually, I got Microsoft Paint here as my little word, <laughs> uh, whiteboard sort of thing. So here, let's... Oh man, my computer's so old. So we're going to talk about reliabilism. Reliabilism is uh, a another position on how to understand the justification term of knowledge being justified true belief, JTB, if you remember that. Um, we were talking about um, coherentism and foundationalism as other sorts of options here. Um, so here I'm going to... Reliable, uh, or I'll, reliabilism. This is another option. This corresponded with the second of uh, Plato's uh, three suggestions for what it might be to have an account for true judgment with an account, that theory of what knowledge is. Um, and if you remember, or you, well, maybe you don't remember, it's been a long time, but this passage, the second one, was really strange. It's when they're talking about 100 are the timbers of a wagon and trying to spell Theodorus's name. There's all this weird stuff going on. Um, what it really, what the second proposal really boils down to, is saying that justification, like the the basis of your belief, can look like a kind of procedure or process. It's not necessarily some other piece of knowledge, like in the case of definitive evidence or a matter of um, being able to just explain the idea or something internal to the idea itself, but that there's maybe a method whereby you figure out which judgments you're going to form. Um, like we were talking very briefly, I think maybe maybe this wasn't in both of my sections, but maybe for one of, your, one of these classes I talked about, um, that there are ways there there's some kind of mechanism or system in place for how we determine what beliefs we're going to have and we might want to think about the justification of the beliefs that result in terms of the processes and mechanisms that led to them so i think we definitely talked about this in both classes that the whole reason why you need another term here why uh, true belief is not enough that you need jtb uh, that you need all of these things is that if it's just true belief it might just be arbitrary right the belief could be like remember my example with luck with like rolling a dice and making a prediction if it just turns out that my belief happened to be true that's not enough for knowledge uh, I can't have lucky knowledge so there's got to be some non arbitrary basis for it and that's where we might get into this process or procedure that I use to form the debate or uh, that I use to form the belief okay Sorry about that little break. I had to take care of something. Um, so we want to have our beliefs not based on something arbitrary. That's that's the really like core idea here. So um, maybe that could be a process. But there's a problem. Um, and this is what Plato brings up in the Theotetus. Um, when you're using a process as your basis for your belief, it seems like there could be a way in which you're doing it you can you're following the process but you're not doing it yet with understanding versus uh, when you're doing it with understanding so for example if um, I'll use a kind of personal anecdote for my life um, when I was younger I was on kind of like a in school I was on like an accelerated math thing I went to a private school and they're like well you could do this other math stuff but we don't really offer classes like that so <clears throat> the solution was I was just gonna like during math period go in a closet and work on the math textbook at my own pace like kind of cruise through it and that was kind of cool to do but it also was kind of not cool because I didn't know how to teach myself and a lot of times I would just be like oh I get this idea and then I'd move on and I wouldn't really train or test my ability at using that procedure or technique or I wouldn't really gain mastery of it right so if I'm generally using the technique poorly um, like I I think I know what I'm doing like I think I've got the procedure in my head but I'm making some like mistakes with it like there's so many times I was like nailed that exam and then I get it back and it's like all these things are missing and wrong so uh, I might be thinking that I'm using the procedure 
um, when I'm actually making mistakes with it. So that's the familiar thing. No real problem here yet. We'll just wait. Let's say I'm like generally not using the technique properly. And then all of a sudden I use the technique and I get a right answer. Does that count as knowledge? Well, we kind of want to say no, right? It, I mean, because of all the other cases in which I didn't, it might have just been a matter of luck that I used the procedure correctly this time. And maybe we don't want to say that I actually know it, that I'm actually knowledgeable here, since so much of the rest of the time I was making mistakes about this. So that that's the kind of, in it, that is effectively what the platonic objection to this second account is in the Theotetus. I'm kind of boiling it all down for you a little bit. I mean, that's a really difficult passage of writing to try to decode what's happening philosophically. But that's really the main thrust of it. This is exactly what motivates reliabilism. They're like, okay, well that's let's just let's just lean into that, right? Let's say if if I have a I'm using a procedure, but it's not just a matter of the abstractness of the procedure, it's also about my skill in using it, of my ability at using it. So if my belief forming mechanisms are following those procedures <clears throat> and are reliably tracking the truth of this phenomenon, then that counts as, as adequate justification. And then if my belief is true, it, then it, it's knowledge. Okay, So that's the approach of reliabilism. I think in one of the sections I talked a little bit about um, re, a, another initial difficulty that emerges with reliabilism. Because if we're like, okay, fair enough, there are mechanisms that create our beliefs, Let's evaluate the mechanisms that are generating those beliefs, see if they're reliable, and if they are, then we can treat that as justification. Okay, how do you tell that a belief-forming mechanism is reliable? Well, I kind of was just talking <clears throat> a second ago about the most intuitive option, like my track record. If I'm normally like making a bunch of errors about this, then we've got a problem, right? I'm, I'm not um, reliable. But wait a second, that's not... Uh, a foolproof technique here for being able to set conditions for reliability for two major reasons. One, my uh, belief forming mechanisms are are moving target. Like over time, they change. So if, if I'm like, I don't know, say 16, 16 years old, uh, I've got a pretty bad track record <laughs> in terms of making true judgments about things. Um, you know, I'm making, I've made a lot of mistakes, or maybe like an eight-year-old or something like that. Like, a lot of my life has involved making false beliefs and correcting them. But the fact that there's that kind of track record of faulty beliefs may not be giving us an accurate picture about where I currently am with my belief-forming mechanisms. That maybe it's because of all those errors that I now have a more reliable belief-forming mechanism because it's informed from those mistakes. So that's not going to be a good test of reliability for that reason. It's always a moving target. So at any one moment, how much of the past evidence can be taken as indications of current reliability, it's, just, it's a little too fuzzy for our tastes, at least in terms of defining what it is. Okay, might be the best we have to work with when it comes to trying to test it, but um, in terms of what reliability is, we'd like to be able to define that in a much more precise way. Um, <clears throat> the other problem is that someone might have never really tested their belief forming mechanisms yet. And the first time they start with it, they might, might have a reliable belief forming mechanisms, but they have no track record for us to be able to tell that that's the case. So my little like example or illustration of this would be uh, a doctor who's been in med school for years, finally graduates, has no track record yet. For whether we know he's makes reliable he or she makes reliable uh, diagnoses or not, um, and then finally they have their first patient. Do they not know what's going on with that patient? Uh, kind of want to say that they do, but the fact if we wanted to make reliability a matter of having a track record, they don't have a track record yet. So there's got to be something else going on here. So both of those kinds of scenarios reveal that we need something. Uh, we can't use basically a um, we can't use a track record going forward in time as the way if you imagine these like events of making judgments in the past and whether they were true or not 
um, we can't use a track record that's moving forward in time. We're going to have to use um, something else. We're going to need, whoa, whoa, whoa. there you go. We're going to need, let's say I'm making a judgment at this point right here. Here's now. Um, draw, drawing. Here's now. Instead of my track record being looked at in the past, temporally, we're going to instead bring out a different dimension here. And this is going to be a dimension of counterfactual possibilities. And counterfactuals are things that aren't the way things actually happened. <laughs> Basically, that's what a counterfactual is. So when we make claims about, like, uh, what if what would have happened if this hadn't happened in the past uh, or if things had been different you know like if the dinosaurs hadn't gone extinct like what would they look like today like would we be dinosaurs instead of mammals you know that kind of thing those what if scenarios or even something as mundane as like uh, if like I, I think I use this example in class maybe um, if I had like set my alarm in a mis if I had forgotten to set my alarm, then maybe I wouldn't have been in class in the morning or something like that. Like, if I had done this different thing, then something else would have been a different result. When we make claims like that, we're making counterfactual claims. We're talking about some other possibility. It's not about what actually happened in the world. All counterfactual claims are actually evaluated in the actual world false because they're contrary to fact. Right? That's... I didn't forget to set my alarm. I did set my alarm. So talking about what would have happened if I didn't is not what actually happened. Okay, But still intuitively, we think when we make these what-if judgments, <clears throat> they could be right or wrong. That there's some kind of truth about what happens under counterfactual possibilities. In order to understand this, a contemporary philosopher of the name of David Lewis um, came up with a different type of semantics for how to understand counterfactual possibilities. And we talk about it in terms of counterfactual possible worlds. So uh, let's, let's give ourselves a, a nice big space of counterfactual worlds here. And there, right there in the center there, we're going to call that the actual world. And then there's going to be all of these other... Um, all these other, uh, what do I want here? I want a brush. There we go. Uh, let's make a bigger brush. Whoa, way too big. <laughs> there we go. You got all these other uh, worlds out here that represent other, basically, universes. <clears throat> and by universe, I just, um, we're defining a universe in terms of a set of all the facts that are true in that universe okay so if we wanted to imagine here um, let me make a smaller line here so if you want to imagine the actual world is con composed of a kind of like set um, I don't know how many of you have done any kind of set theoretic stuff in um, math but there are these kinds of symbols that you draw, these like brackets, with a matrix of values inside. So we might say P, Q, R, and so on. That there's like a bunch of propositions that are true in this universe. And in a different universe, like say this one over here, it might be a counterfactual set. Uh, actually, here, let's do this. Make myself it's a little lazy. There we go. Just copy-paste it. Um, but let's say, like, the facts are different in this one, right? So instead of P, maybe we've got not P. Q is still true, uh, but let's, let's make R false, too. Uh, and so on. So the facts are different in this possible world than this possible world. Okay? So this map that we have in this circle are all the possibilities. What if this? What if this? What if this? All these different scenarios. They're not the ones that actually happened. 
but they're the ones that could have happened instead. So if we're thinking um, of splaying out here like all these different other possible circumstances for what happened in this moment with me, with my belief forming mechanisms, okay, so we're going to hold those stable. Maybe we could use these counterfactual possibilities as a way of getting a sense for um, how, what's my track record with this belief forming mechanism. It's kind of like um, imagine you could like redo the same moment over and over and over under slightly different conditions. Kind of like doing an exper a scientific experiment if you want to test something. You want to say like how reliable is this mechanism? Imagine some kind of physical mechanism. Um, you might want to test it under different circumstances, maybe like stress tests, like how much pressure before it breaks, how much force bending it before it breaks, and you try it under different circumstances. What if it's cold? What if it's hot? You know, to be able to get a sense of what this thing has going on. Imagine counting these counterfactual possibilities as our, our ability to kind of test, do a stress test on a belief forming mechanism to see how reliably it's tracking what's happening, happening in, in reality. Like whether the belief forming mechanism generates beliefs that match up with how reality is. If it's tracking, if it's corresponding to that, then we want to say it's reliable. Now there's a couple different ways to do this. Um, and I want to talk about them. Um, even though this is, this is a 101 class and we're starting to get into much deeper territory here, I thought it might be a little fun. So I'm, I'm going to throw you a little bit in the deep end here. Um, and uh, I think I, I think it'll be cool. So uh, hopefully, um, I wish I would, had you in front of me and we could talk about this. Hopefully, so far, so good. We got the general idea of what reliabilism wants to do. Uh, we understand possible world spaces and what defines possible worlds. So they're just like alternate sets of facts, alternate ways things could have been. Okay, now how can we use this theoretical device to test reliability of belief forming mechanisms. Well, sensitivity theory comes along here and it says, basically, here, I'll, I'll draw it as like a procedure. Um, let's, uh, let's go back to the actual world here. So, uh, yeah, let me do this. Let's go here. So in the actual world, you'll notice P is true. And I also believe that P. So I'm, I'm going to, let's, let's simplify these worlds a little bit. I'm going to do this like this now. So we've got two facts that are true in the actual world and a bunch of others too, right? Like Trump is president and uh, it's a Tuesday. Yeah, <laughs> it's a Tuesday, things like that. So um, in this, in the actual world, P is true, and I believe that P is true. That's what these symbols right here mean. Sensitivity theory is going to say, go to the nearest possible world in which P is false, and see if S believes P. Okay, so S stands for uh, a subject, the person, who we're testing their belief-forming mechanism. So what, what the sensitivity standard is telling us to do is go out in possible world space to the nearest possible world in which you get not P, right? Where instead of P being true, it's actually false. And then ask yourself the question, does S still believe that P is true? Okay, so... If, if S does believe that P is true when P is not true, then it's not, then their belief forming mechanism is not sensitive to the difference between P being true or false. That's how, that's the logic of this sensitivity standard. That, um, you know, if you're forming the belief when it is true, that's great. You don't want to be forming that belief when it's not true. You want to withhold that or believe that it's false instead. That would be better. Um, you just don't want to believe that it's true if it's actually false. That shows that you calling it true is not sensitive to the actual circumstances of what's happening. Now, why are we going to the nearest possible world in which P is false? Well, because if we start going out to possible worlds in which 
so many facts have changed, like so many variables have been changed, then it's kind of like all bets are off, right? Remember, um, we form our belief forming mechanisms to deal with the actual world. We make mistakes and then calibrate them, right? But if you're now trying to take that uh, set of um, mechanisms that have been tailored and calibrated to our actual world and throw them into like a world in which the laws of physics are totally different, then it's like, what do you expect? Of course, of course there's going to be failure. That's not a reasonable standard of reliability. So what we mean by nearest possible world is the world that where you change as few facts as possible until you get to the case in which you're able to make p false. So here's a very simple example. There's a, a fish tank over there with our fish in it. So I'm like, there's a fish in the fish tank. I form that belief. And in the actual world, it's true, let's just say. <laughs> Common sense here. Um, sensitivity theory would say, okay, change the facts that you need to in order for uh, there to not be a fish in the fish tank right now. So what would that require? Well, probably the, the quickest thing to change would be something like this. Um, a few months back, our fish almost died. Um, it got really cold while we were gone for a weekend. Uh, our neighbor forgot to feed it and turn the heat up. Um, fish almost died. We came home. She was like, we thought she was going to die. Turns out she lived. What if she hadn't pulled through? Just a little nudge into life versus death there. And then at this moment, there wouldn't be a fish in the fish tank. Okay. We just had to change a small, we didn't have to change what the speed of light is. We didn't have to say I have snakes for hair or that we breathe cotton candy or some wild crap. Um, we just had to change a few very small little details in the facts from the actual world, and we get to this nearest possible world in which P is false. Would I still believe that P? No, I wouldn't. Why? Because my belief-forming mechanisms based on my eyes and my understanding of the concept of fish, that's a pretty reliable belief-forming mechanism. My judgments about fish and fish tanks are pretty reliable. Okay, um, So... That's, uh, that's how sensitivity would work. Let's talk really briefly about a second option. And if you got questions, if you ever want to talk to me more about this, I would love to. Um, it's really cool stuff. I just wanted to give you a little sneak preview of... It, this stuff's a little weird, too, so I'm hoping my lecture is making some kind of sense. But we're using the possible worlds, the what-ifs of other scenarios, to test the way in which the processes and procedures that we use to form our beliefs. Um, maybe at this point, using the examples I've given, I forgot to mention this earlier, but maybe it's already clear, belief-forming mechanisms could be things that are hardwired, like my the way my neurology is set up with my sense organs of my eyeballs and how my brain processes those signals. That's all part of a belief-forming mechanism that involves a judgment of there's a goldfish in the, in the tank kind of thing. Um, but there's also a lot of things that are soft-wired, right? Like... Um, my example of the doctor going to medical school, like, that, that's not a matter of, they're not, like, doing some surgery to their brain to make themselves better doctors or something. We're not at that kind of transhuman <laughs> scenario. Um, but what they're doing is learning things. They're changing their thinking patterns. They're training their mind software uh, in order to think in different ways that are going to more reliably create accurate judgments. So like my lack of math training was a matter of that kind of software stuff too. So belief forming mechanisms can be uh, diverse is what I'm saying. Um, one of my belief forming mechanisms could be to defer to another person who's an, I, I'm treating as an authority on that matter. right? That's my way of generating judgments and as long as they're reliable then my judgments will be reliable. That's called the argument from authority. And there is, uh, there's reason to use it. <laughs> it's not an irrational form of reasoning to use somebody else as your way of making reliable judgments. Okay. I mean, it passes the buck, of course, but um, that's another thing you can do. All right, now what's going on with safety? Um, safety is saying that S generally, and there's a little fuzziness there, um, uh, oh, no, I, let me, sorry, I have to reword this. Generally, in nearby possible worlds, when S believes 
P, P is true. Now this might sound very, very similar to what's going on with sensitivity, but it is slightly different. Okay, how is it different? First off, it's throwing in this wrinkle of a boundary of nearby possible worlds. However, that's defined, which is left ambiguous. <laughs> so we don't, we, I mean, that's, that's going to be an issue. Oh, and I should, uh, let's make this, actually, I should have included the world that this is pointing at um, as within the scope of nearby possible worlds. Okay, and uh, let's give ourselves another, here's a, here's a nearby possible world, there's a nearby possible world, there's a nearby possible world, there's a nearby possible world. Okay, so now we're looking at like a bunch of these. Um, so you can think about these as all, all relevant now. We're not going to just the nearest, the one single nearest possible world in which P is false to see if S believes P as a way to test the reliability of the belief forming mechanism. Now we're looking at how does the belief forming mechanism fare in all the worlds that are sort of nearby. And where is this boundary? Well, the, there's a lot of hand waving at this point. I mean, that there is some kind of boundary seems intuitive, like that there's a difference between possible worlds in which the laws of nature's nature have changed versus ones in which these minor little details have have shifted. Like my hat's blue instead of red, or something like I clicked on the the button right to the left rather than the right, something like that. Um, so it's it's those kind of nearby possible worlds, not the real zany wacky ones. Those ones. Safety is saying, just like with sensitivity, that's not relevant for evaluating your belief forming mechanisms. Um, okay, but the little the standard is a little different this time. Now we're just looking at the worlds in which S believes that P. So we're not looking at all the worlds in which P is true. We're just looking at the worlds in which S believes that P. This is called safety because it encourages a kind of conservative judgment of like generally withholding judgment. What you're kind of seeing is like, what's going on with this belief forming mechanism when it actually steps out on the limb and says, yes, believe that P. Is P true? That's the question. If P is false in many cases nearby possible worlds, in many nearby possible worlds in which S believes that P, then the belief forming mechanism is not safe and then your knowledge in the actual world, your, your belief in the actual world is not knowledge. Okay, so what it takes to have a reliable belief forming mechanism for safety theory is that whenever you step out on the limb to form the belief that P, it needs to be true, or at least generally. Maybe there's a couple cases in which you fail at this and you made mistakes, but your, your track record here in possible world space is doing pretty good. Both sensitivity and safety theory have their supporters, um, and people like them for different reasons. There's a big debate. I'm not going to get into all the kind of like really teeth gnashing <laughs> details of this, um, but if you want to explore this more, it's fascinating stuff. The, they're just two different ways um, of, uh, they're di two different theme variations on the same theme here, that maybe in order to have knowledge, you need justified true belief. And your justification is really a matter of some kind of procedure or process, uh, and that if, of how your beliefs get made, what we call belief forming mechanisms. And if those belief forming mechanisms are reliably tracking, <clears throat> or they're reliably hooked up with how reality actually is, then the beliefs that they generate are knowledge when true. But uh, figuring out what was a reliable belief forming mechanism, we needed a standard for that, and that's what we're using this possible world space to do. So I, I'm repeating myself a lot, but I'm just trying to sum it all up and make it as clear as possible because I can't ask and see if you have any questions, but I hope this was interesting to you. Um, this is definitely some cutting edge epistemology. Um, it's pretty interesting thinking about how to use possible world space here. Uh, lots of fascinating things going on. So. Um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed that. We're going to be moving on to Descartes when I see you next. So this, this lecture is a substitute for us talking in class about it. But if you want to reach out outside of class and ask me some more questions about it, I'd be happy to do that. Um, okay. Stay safe. Stay warm. Hopefully I'll see you tomorrow. We'll see. <laughs>